I'd like to tell you today about a cosmic quest, a fishing expedition to use the cosmic microwave background radiation as a giant gravity wave detector to try and hear the echoes of cosmic genesis written in the ripples of space time itself. The cosmic microwave background radiation is a sea of photons filling the universe, traveling every which way, filling space. And the intensity of those photons as a function of wavelength is given by this curve here. And plotted on this curve are actual measurements made by the COBE satellite in the 1990s. And the measurements shown there as the blue, as the blue dots have error bars that are smaller than the width of the line. This black body curve has one parameter to, that allows the theory to fit those measurements, and that is the temperature. And the temperature of the photons filling space is 2.7 Kelvin. If you had microwave eyes or millimeter wave eyes, you could go out into space and you could look around and what you would see is the glow of this radiation everywhere. That glow is left over from a hot, dense phase in the early universe, when the universe was hot enough, actually, that hydrogen could not form. The protons and electrons that make up hydrogen were knocked apart into their constituent particles flying through space. And the universe, therefore, was filled with a plasma, those protons, electrons, and light. In fact, if you managed to transport yourself back to that time and sit there and look around, it would be much like sitting just underneath the surface of the sun in the hot plasma there. Now, from that phase, as the universe expanded and cooled, eventually it cooled through a temperature about 3,000 Kelvin, when the universe was about 380,000 years old. That that plasma, the protons and electrons in that plasma could get back together and they could form hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen is a clear gas. The photons that had been bouncing around in the plasma off the charged particles suddenly were set free. Their mean free path, the distance that they travel between interactions or scatterings became the size of the observable universe. Those photons are the photons that we see today as the cosmic microwave background, left over from when the universe was 380,000 years old. They can tell us a lot about the universe through their, the ability to do car, cosmic archaeology. And to give you a feeling for how that works, let's think about what we actually see when we look at the microwave background. This is the Earth sitting out there in space. Well, remember, space is filled with these photons going every which way. However, with our telescopes here on Earth, we can only see the photons that are pointed at us, of course. And we can follow those photons that are pointed at us backwards in time along their path throughout the history of the universe. And eventually we get to a place, a time in the early universe, far, far away from us along that photon's path, where they last scattered off of the plasma that makes up the early universe. So when we look in different directions in the sky and look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, we're really probing the inside surface of a plasma sphere centered on us. Now, some people look at this picture and they think, oh, wow, we are at the center of the universe. That's not true, okay? Unfortunately, it's not true. We are, however, at the center of everything we can see. That's what this picture tells us, okay? Now, when the microwave background was discovered in 1965 by Penzias and Wilson at Bell Labs, it was very soon after, thereafter realized that we actually should see variations in the intensity of this light as we look at different places on the inside surface of this sphere. The reason is that we know there's cosmic structure out there in the universe. Galaxies and clusters of galaxies and all this cosmic web exists out there. And those structures had to form by gravitational collapse. But to do so, they needed seeds. There needed to be initial density perturbations that would allow that process to start. Those same density perturbations would have to exist in the plasma. And because of that, when we look at different places or different directions in the sky, different places on the inside surface of that plasma sphere, we should see slightly different temperatures or intensities of the microwave background. When I was a graduate student in 1990, 25 years after the uh, discovery of the microwave background, 
despite 25 years of fishing for those signals, they had not yet been seen. But very soon thereafter, in 1992, the COBE satellite announced the first detections of such variations in the intensity of the microwave background on large angular scales. A series of ground-based and balloon-borne experiments then started putting out data that showed that more and more information about these, uh, these variations. And it wasn't until 1998, when colleagues and I flew an experiment called Boomerang around Antarctica, that we actually were able to make the very first high signal to noise maps of the inside surface of that plasma sphere. This map right here made by Boomerang shows hot and cold spots, over dense and under dense spots in that plasma. This is not instrumental noise. This is real actual variations, density variations, temperature variations in the plasma of the early universe. Since then, other experiments have gone on to make beautiful all-sky maps that show these same signals, but now over the whole sky. This looks like noise, but it's not. It's actually hot and cold spots, over-dense and under-dense spots in that plasma surrounding us. Now, it turns out that the sound waves in this room are also density variations and temperature variations of the air in this room. So if you had an amazing infrared thermal imaging camera, you could take a snapshot of a sound wave traveling through this room. And if you had a flute off to one side, it, that snapshot might look something like this, where the white rings are the overdense hot spots, and the dark rings are the underdense cold spots in the sound wave. If you had a tuba, off to the other side of the room, it might look something like this, where the wavelength is longer. If you instead put a thousand instruments in the room, blowing different notes of different strengths, you might see something like this, with your snapshot of the sound in the room. It looks like noise, and it might sound like noise, <laughs> but if we, if we mathematically analyze this this image of the sound waves, we can learn something about the strength of all the different notes that are playing in the room. We might graph this information on an equalizer plot, where on the x-axis we have the frequency of the sound wave in that image, and color represents low notes to high notes. And the height of the bar here shows you how strong that note is in the set of sound waves filling that room. Getting back to the cosmic microwave background map, we can do very similar mathematics to ask what is the strength of different waves, density waves, in the plasma of the early universe. And when we do that, we find something very interesting. It's not flat. There are features in this cosmic equalizer display. We have learned an enormous amount from these features. We have learned the absolute density of the normal matter, the type of stuff that makes up you and me in the universe. We have learned the absolute density of dark matter in the universe. We have learned the absolute dense energy density of dark energy in the universe. We have learned that space-time is uncurved on large scales, that parallel lines stay parallel as they travel through space. Despite learning all this, we're excited by the fact that there may be another amazing signal hidden in the photons of the microwave background. And that signal is requ it requires us to measure the polarization of the microwave background with great sensitivity. That signal has the possibility of teaching us something about the theory of cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation was invented in the early 1970s by Alan Guth. And it's the idea that sometime in the very early universe, perhaps when the universe was 10 to the minus 34 seconds old, that space-time underwent an extremely rapid hyper-expansion, expanding by a factor of maybe 10 to the 20 times as much as it would have otherwise in that period of time. It's an audacious idea. But the theory of inflation has given us possible answers to some very difficult cosmic questions. One of those questions is we, we call the flatness problem. 
why is the space-time of the universe so close to flat? It turns out that a flat space-time is very special. It requires a very delicate balance between the expansion rate of the universe and the energy density of the stuff in the universe. It's a very special balance that it turns out over time becomes more and more difficult to maintain, or rather I should say that if we're not directly balanced at the perfect spot, then that lack of balance becomes more obvious over time. And 13 billion years is a lot of time. Inflation solves another problem called the horizon problem. And it, that problem is that if I look off in this direction and I look at the microwave background, I see that 2.7 Kelvin radiation. If I look in this direction, I also see that 2.7 Kelvin radiation. That doesn't sound like a problem until you start doing some math. And if you assume a standard expansion history of the universe, what you find is that the plasma that is over here emitting microwave background radiation has never been in causal contact with the plasma over there. Those photons are just getting to us right now. They haven't had time to talk. How did they both know to be 2.7 Kelvin? Inflation solves this by changing the expansion history of the universe. What it does is it allows those two spots to get in causal contact, and then it separates them during that hyperexpansion. Inflation, or rather the simplest, I would say, models of inflation also predicted some details of density perturbations or the distribution of density perturbations in the universe, some of which have been measured with the cosmic microwave background, some of which have been measured by the distribution of galaxies throughout space. And those predictions have turned out to be true. These are significant feathers in cosmic inflation's cap. But they don't teach us a lot about the physics of inflation. They also do leave room for alternative models of the early universe to produce such uh, signatures. And this is where this new signal in the microwave background, this polarization signal in the microwave background comes in. Now, where does this signal come from? What is it? Okay. The answer is that inflation produces, or can produce, I should say, a spectrum of gravity waves that then fills the universe. It creates them, and then those gravity waves are there, and they are not attenuated with time. They just expand with the universe, and they're filling space, and they're going every which way, kind of like the microwave background photons. And if those gravity waves were produced by inflation or some other mechanism in the early universe, then they should have been still there when the universe was 380,000 years old, traveling through the plasma. Those gravitational waves distort the plasma. They stretch it and compress it in ways that can lead to a particular pattern of polarization signature in the microwave background. That distortion of the plasma leads to some slight polarization headed our way. Now, unfortunately, this signal is very, very weak at best. To give you an idea of how weak, I'm going to put up another plot now of the temperature variation signal, the intensity variation signal that I plotted before. This is a slightly different graph where to get this idea across, I had to have a log scale on the y-axis, which says that every set of lines there going across the plot, the grid lines, every one of those is another factor of 10 reduction in the size of the signal that we're getting. The temperature variation signal that we've measured is way up there at the top of the plot. The inflation polarization signal is, unfortunately, way down here, a factor of at least several hundred smaller than the intensity variation or temperature variation signal. Now, we are fortunate, though, that millimeter wave detector technology has its own kind of Moore's law, where every year we are able to build more and more sensitive detectors. And to, get that, to give you some visuals for that idea, I want to show you the camera that we flew on the second flight of Boomerang back in 2003. This camera had all of 16 detectors on it. It was a 16 pixel camera. And as you can see, those detectors were wired up and mounted all by hand. Each one had a name. Just this past year, we flew another instrument around Antarctica called SPIDER to look for this signal. That focal plane looks like this. It's made with lithographic techniques in a clean room, microfabrication. And this particular focal plane has about 512 detectors on it. We flew six such focal planes in SPIDER. 
we're right now trying to build a 15,000 camera detector, or 15,000 detector camera for the South Pole Telescope to go after these signals. This explosion, or Moore's Law, in the sensitivity of the instruments that we're able to build has brought us to the point where we have the sensitivity to seriously go after these polarization signals to tell us about those cosmic gravity waves, whether they're there or whether they're not. Do I think that we're actually going to detect them? Well, it's not just an issue of, of sensitivity. It turns out that just this past year, we were shown that the Milky Way is also emitting some polarized signals. This was not entirely unexpected, but the problem is worse than at least I hoped. Here, the green region shows you how bad the Milky Way signals are at one of the best observing frequencies and in one of the best spots of sky. And as you can see, they're probably going to mask the inflation signal. They are certainly going to com complicate our lives. We can combat this, though, by observing in, at more than one frequency. The CMB signal follows that beautiful black body curve. The Milky Way signals do not. They have different brightnesses as a function of wavelength. So in fact, this last year when we flew Spider, Spider has six telescopes on it, three of which are sensitive to light at three millimeters wavelength, three are sensitive to two millimeter wavelength light. And right now, in fact, we're building cameras sensitive to one millimeter wavelength light for our next flight. Will we be able, though, to see these signals in the polarization of the microwave background that will tell us about these cosmic uh, gravity waves that will potentially tell us something about inflation? I think that if the signals lie between the red curves that I had on that previous plot, that the answer is very likely yes. And we are fortunate in that Many models of inflation, or perhaps the simplest models of inflation, have predicted signals in that range. But it is entirely possible that the physics that drove inflation was such that not enough gravity waves were produced and we will never see a signal. It is also entirely possible that inflation is simply the wrong paradigm. These thoughts sometimes give me pause. Do you bother to go fishing in a lake that might not hold any fish? I think that depends on the fish. This one, clues as to the very origins of our universe, the seeds of everything that came since, that's some fish. Looking at our progress over the past 25 years, the amazing developments in our ability to, to tease out these signals, and looking, frankly, at the fish that we've managed to catch in our nets, these make me optimistic. Thank you.